Good morning, church. Would you stand and join us? Good morning and welcome to a time of worship of Creepwood Baptist Church. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we extend to you a word of welcome. And if you are visiting with us in, per in person this morning, we have something called a connect card that says, hey, we're glad you're here. And we are glad you're here. And I invite you to take the card and fill out with the requested information. 
and hand it to me. I'll be waiting in the pastor's corner after the service. That will be to your left as you exit the sanctuary this morning. To whoever is weary and needs rest, to whoever is lonely and needs a friend, to whoever sins and needs a savior, to whoever will come, our church opens wide its doors. And I'm glad to see everybody here this morning, and especially the crowd behind me, the choir. <laughs> so thank you, Jody and Chris and Tim and Becca and Barry for leading. And there's a group of us who can make a joyful noise, and we can maybe, we can be the alternate choir sometime. <laughs> Um, on a bit of um, explanation, the Miller family is experiencing illness this morning, so do be in prayer for them, and that means I'm standing here before you right now, and I'll be at the end of the service, and then Tim Wildsmith will be our guest pulpiteer this morning, so welcome to the pulpit, Tim. <laughs> We also have, you saw the slide there, the offering for state missions, the golden offering for Tennessee missions is being taken all month long. If you are writing a check, you can simply on the four line put golden, that will do fine. And we have the offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary. And then uh, if you're giving online, just simply in the drop down box, select the golden offering for state missions. And that's all month long. Speaking of missions, the women on mission is resuming their monthly Bible study this Tuesday at 10 a.m. And that will be in room 307. And there's a special guest speaker, Sarah Davis, is joining us, or joining the women, that uh, Tuesday. And she has written a new book called A Life-Changing Commitment. And we'll be discussing that. And Sarah has a special relationship to this church as, as our special friend over the years because she is personally responsible for getting our church involved in medical missions in Honduras many years ago. And speaking of that, uh, the Luke 9-2 medical mission team is leaving Wednesday of this week for a five-day mission trip down to uh, Central America and be in prayer for them. I think that's all the announcements. It's so great to see everybody's faces this morning. Join me in prayer, please. God, we do praise you. You are our God, you're our Heavenly Father, and we give you all our praise this morning. You do marvelous things in our midst, God. Some that we are aware of and some we just take for granted, perhaps. But we give you the thanks and glory for all that you do in the world that you created and in the lives of people all across the globe. We rejoice in the salvation that we have through your son, Jesus, and we give you this time of worship in his name this morning. I do pray for the Millers, their health, and for all those in our church who are carrying a burden, whether it's grief or illness or something else. Bless Sarah's time with us on Tuesday as she discusses how you are working, whether it's here or abroad. And God also ask your blessing on the mission trip and for the team that's leaving Wednesday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. All my Sunday school classes down here waving at me. We'll be reading this morning. Our psalm is uh, Psalm 98. And uh, I'll be reading from the NIV this morning, which is the same Bible that's in the pews, if you'd like to read along with me. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. That's Psalms 99, pardon me. Psalms 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. 
All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for the joy of the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blasts of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Why don't we all stand and worship together? Oh. 
Isn't it good to worship this morning? Man. I hear lots of voices in the front, too. It's awesome. Isn't it so cool that there's not a lot of rules about worship? (laughs) Sometimes I think we make it complicated, but I can wear a hat or not. We can have a choir or not. But the choir is a big yes, Yes. in in my opinion. (laughs) But you know what? We just come and we respond to God. That's what worship is, right? And so this morning, it's just good to be here, all of us, all of us in unique stories, all of us in the middle of a journey, and we can bring our true selves to God in worship. That's the only rule. That's the only requirement. Everything else is like, hey, put those hands up or don't. Jump around or take a nap, you know. You know, we say that um, we don't work for our salvation, but sometimes you walk in church and you feel like you've got to, and you don't, but you can respond to the good news of who God is. And if that makes your hands go up, then just let them go, right? Just be where you are and God will meet you there. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. verse together. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your love and your goodness that sets us free. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Adults, you can be seated. Kids, you can come down front for the children's sermon. It's good to see everyone this morning. So I want you to look on that table over there and look at the flowers. Can you see them? What colors do you see? Pink, yellow. Yeah, lots of different colors, don't you? Well, do you know that some friends of mine, Miss Cindy and Tanner Monterez, gave those flowers this morning in memory of my mom. So they gave uh, some money to Miss Sassy, and she got flowers, and she arranged them so beautifully. So my mother went to be with Jesus last year. She's in heaven now. And you know, my mother was a really wonderful person. She loved to cook and to bake and to garden. Do some of your moms like to do those things? Yeah, to cook, yeah, and bake. She loved her family. I know your moms love your family, their families too. But do you know who she loved most of all? Way to go, Mook. Yeah. She did, and she loved to tell people about Jesus because she loved Jesus more than anything else. And she knew how much Jesus loved her. And she knew that there were people who had never heard about Jesus. Can you imagine not ever having heard about Jesus. And she know the, knew those people needed to hear about Jesus. So when someone would come to her house to fix something, she would tell them about Jesus. She had Mr. Scott who used to come and fix her wheelchair. And Mr. Scott knew about Jesus because my mom told him. She had people that came in the house and cared for her, like nurses. And she would tell them about Jesus. She wanted to make sure that they knew how much Jesus loved them. And it reminds me of something Jesus said in the Bible. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus was telling them that they needed to go out and tell people about Jesus. So I hope that as you go through your life, you will tell other people about Jesus too. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for my mom, and I thank you for all the people that she told about Jesus, and there were many. We thank you that you love us and that you want us to tell other people about your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Martha. <clears throat> well, as uh, Pastor Will said, my name is Tim Wildsmith, and I, am, I got called in from the bullpen this morning. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this message with two apologies. Number one is um, we were already getting in the car when we found out that, that Pastor Ray was sick. And so I apologize for the way I look. This is like worship leader attire, but maybe not quite to preacher attire level. So I, I would have looked a little bit nicer. I might have worn khaki pants. Um, so I apologize for that. And, and two, I apologize that um, we started a new sermon series about women in the Bible called Brave and God's faithfulness to women in the Bible. And I did not have a uh, women in the Bible uh, great sermon in my back pocket. Um, so, so we're going to take a pause from that sermon series, and we're going to let Pastor Ray pick it up next week. Um, what you are about to hear is, is actually my, my sermon for tomorrow morning. I'm preaching in chapel at Belmont University, where I'm one of the campus ministers, and um, I had this prepared. And so I texted back and said, I got this thing I got to do tomorrow. I could use some practice. So um, this is the practice run, if that's all right with you guys. So thank you. Um, um, 
so uh, just to set this up for you, in, in Mondays, we have chapel on Mondays and Wednesdays at 10 a.m. at Belmont. And on Mondays this semester, we are kind of doing this series about believing. And our university minister, my boss, Heather Doherty, said to all of our chapel speakers on Monday, I want to prompt you to think about what is something we believe as people of faith? What is something we believe? Let's talk about that. But not just that. Um, what do you believe about blank? And then, like, the deeper question is, and how would that shape the way we live? Not just what do we believe, but how does it impact the way we actually live? There's a lot of different topics, right, that we could talk about, a lot of different aspects of our faith, elements that we could dive into and be explored. But how do those beliefs, and so we've asked all these different, different chapel speakers to kind of explore something and say, okay, how does that actually impact the way, if we really believe it, the way that we would live our lives on a daily basis? How does, it, how does it play into our lives? So I started thinking about this, and honestly, first thing that comes to mind for me when I think about what I believe is, what does the Bible say, right? I'm kind of one of those old-school Bible-believing Christians, and I go, what does the Bible say? That's where I'm going to go to. I'm going to find a text in the Bible. I'm going to preach about what this text says. That's what we believe. This is how it shapes the live. This is how it shapes the way we live. And, and so that's where I started. And which topic should I explore? And then, and then it hit me. What if I did the entire Bible? I'm serious. Um, and I'm going to get you out of here before lunchtime, I promise. Um, they, ha they, have, they have class at 11, so I can only go up until 1055. Um, why, not, why pick one verse or passage when I could do the whole thing? What I mean is when you, when you step back, right, and you look at the, the bigger, you know, we say 30,000-foot view. When you look at the bigger picture of the Bible, you see this kind of overarching narrative, a, a storyline, for lack of a better term, that is unfolding throughout the entire narrative of Scripture. I think that if we see that storyline for what it is, if we believe that storyline that God is unfolding for what it is, I think it does have the ability to deeply impact the way we live our lives, to see the big picture and to see how we fit into that big storyline. How do we find our place in this story? My, 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 they're promoting it at chapel at Belmont is God's storyline and you. That's the name of the, the message for chapel. So are you with me? Let's dive in. Okay, so many of you have been to seminary, I know, and have studied theology. There's this, this idea called the grand narrative that a lot of theologians and historians talk about with the Bible. And the grand narrative is, is the, the overarching storyline of the Bible. They kind of divide it into often different acts, like acts of a play, act one, act two, act three. Most commonly, there's like four different acts in the grand narrative of scripture. But because I'm, you know, think I'm awesome, I'm going to add a couple more. I'm going to give you six. I'm going to give us six. I'm going to give you all your money's worth today. So first, the first act what would the first act of the Bible be? Creation. That's act one. Act one takes place in Genesis 1 and 2. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but the, the story of creation is actually told twice. Chapter 1 and chapter 2. They're slightly different, which is you know, problematic for some people. But I think it's this, this beautiful picture of how God created this story that we're a part of, right? Um, and, and I think what we're supposed to take away from those first two chapters of Genesis, I think the big picture we're supposed to take away is that there is a creator, a loving God, who created all of this, including humans, right? That's us. We find ourselves right here at the very beginning. God created humans. And this world that God created, what was it full of? It was, it was not full of war and outrageous gas prices. It wasn't full of political disagreements. No, it was full of beauty and peace and love, and goodness. God lived in this garden that he created and everything was perfect. Verse 31, I'm going to be jumping around the Bible a lot today. I apologize. So I don't have one main text, but verse 31 in Genesis chapter one, the very opening chapter of the Bible, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. That's how the opening chapter of the Bible concludes. God saw everything he made, and it was very good. That's how this, this grand narrative, that's how this storyline begins. In peace and harmony and goodness, it was very good. That's, that's the way this story started. That was what the God intended for it, right? But we know that it quickly got off course, 
What does every good story need? A villain, right? Chapter 3, the serpent shows up. That's Satan. Act 2 in our story is called The Fall. And we get that right away in chapter 3 of Genesis. Satan is this, this fallen angel who is working against God, and he convinces the humans to reject God's rules. He had some rules in the garden, actually one big rule, and they, they rejected it. They eat from this one tree that was off limits. And we call this the fall. This is where sin enters the world. I would argue that the actual true villain of this grand narrative that God is telling throughout time and space and history and creation is sin, not Satan. That sin steps into the world and, and, and all of a sudden there are these consequences that go with sin, right? What are the consequences right there in chapter 3 of Genesis that we learn from sin, right? They are expelled from the garden. This good and perfect world that God has created for them, they can no longer be there. That means separation from God. They are not living in perfect, peaceful harmony. He talks about the, the, the man having to toil the earth and work the ground, pain in childbirth for the woman. All of a sudden, things are not perfect and beautiful anymore because of sin. And eventually, what happens? Death. This leads to death. So right away, chapter 3, this story kind of goes off course. Separation from God, ex expulsion from this beautiful garden, leading to death. And I think... If, if our big takeaway from creation is this good, beautiful thing that God created, I think our big takeaway from the fall is that we all have inherited that world that's broken by sin. Paul, the apostle, in Romans 3, says it so clearly, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We inherit this, this brokenness. The story started out perfect, y'all, but sin screwed that up. And the worst part about that is that they lost the ability to live in that direct communion and that goodness with God. There was this, this separation. And that brings us to Act 3. This is the one that I'm kind of adding in there. But the rest of the Old Testament, if you have, you have Act 1 and Act 2 happen in the first three chapters of the Bible, Act 3 is what I'm going to call the entire rest of the Old Testament. I'm going to call it Israel. Because that's the name of God's people and it's the story of the people of Israel. It's everything that happens between them and the start of the New Testament when Jesus arrives on the scene. That's Act 4. We're going to get there in a second. Now, for me to sum summarize all of the Old Testament in, in one act, I'm, I'm, as obviously this is why I can do the sermon in less than 14 hours. Because I'm not going to like dig deep into here. But I, well, what's the big story? What's the big takeaway in Act 3 of the story of the people of Israel? Well, we learned that as, as, I'm trying to think of the right words, as foolish and sinful as they were, God did not abandon his people, did he? But he did give them a bunch of, of rules that they had to follow. Most people, when they read the Bible in a year, they start off and they're like, Genesis, yes, Exodus, yes, Leviticus, I'm done reading the Bible in a year. <laughs> right? Because in Leviticus, you get to all these rituals and feasts and sacrifices and offerings and this really complex legal system that the Levites wanted to be in there right at the middle of the Pentateuch. It's like this is the central aspect of it. And of course God's people could never live up to that. They were constantly, uh, this, this part of the story throughout the Old Testament is full of crazy moments, right? Some of them are so R-rated that we never talk about them in church. It's adventures in missing the point with the people of Israel. All of these ups and downs, they are continuously making these stupid mistakes and turning their backs on God. We see it all right before this in Exodus. They're literally, they're literally making this covenant with God. Moses goes up the mountain and they get bored and they make a golden calf. And, and God, God's like, well, what's wrong with these people? We just made this covenant, right? Ups and downs, back and forth. They always screw up again. This eventually leads to, I think, the defining the defining moment of this, of this history, this Israel act in the scriptures, is the exile of the people of Israel. They are carried away as captives. They are removed from their homeland and taken to Babylon. And so much of the Old Testament is, is compiled and put together and, and looked at in, through this lens of the exile of God's people as the worst moment in their history. Where the consequences really became that they could no longer be in their own homeland that God had given them. Yet throughout, we see this covenant, right? It's being renewed. Abraham, Moses, David. Even though they mess up time and time again, God's enduring love for his people persists, right? He does not abandon his people. He comes close a couple times. But he never gives up on them. And yet, it's pretty clear that they're not going to be able to get their act together 
and figure this, this thing out for themselves. So then we get all these books of prophecy, right? Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. God sends these prophets and, and they tell the Israelites a lot of things. I actually just, I'm in my read through the Bible in a year plan and I just finished the minor prophets and there's a lot in there. Some of it's very dark. But I think one of the main things we learn from them is that God is going to send a hero into this story who is going to save them once and for all. Listen to the way the prophet Isaiah says it in chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. This is the New Living Translation. It was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. All of these sacrifices and rituals and offerings and feasts that they have to celebrate to be made holy, to be made pure in God's sight is all going to be placed on this, this person that they're speaking of. This lamb of God. This good shepherd. Does it sound familiar? So all throughout Act 3, it's, it's this building and building and building. Adventures and missing the point. These crazy Israelites. Lots of ups and downs and crazy stories along the way. And it's building and building and building to this climactic fourth act. So again, let's just do a quick recap. A little intermission, if you will. Act 1 creation. God creates this place and it is full of beauty and truth and goodness. Act two, sin enters and breaks all of that up. The consequences are separation from God's goodness and eventually death. In act three, we get this long and winding road of the Israelites, God's people not being able to figure it out and fix it for themselves. And so act four is so incredible, right? Because something wild happens. God does something incredible. The storyteller steps into the storyline. The storyteller enters the story himself. Act four is commonly called redemption. I would just simply call it Jesus because that's what it's about. Jesus enters the story. For about three years, he travels around. He preaches. I'm reading the Gospel of Matthew right now. And every time he gets somewhere, it says he preaches... He heals the sick, he talks about the kingdom of God, and he heals the sick. That's what he did. He preaches, he teaches in the synagogues, he preaches about the kingdom of God being near, and then he heals the sick. He just does this this time and time again. He's telling people that God's kingdom is coming, and everything is going to be restored to the way that it was in the garden. It's going to be good again. He keeps telling them this over and over and over again. He's pointing back to that original goodness, and people start to get excited about it. Everywhere he goes, they find him. He can't, he can't be alone. He tries to go across the sea. They follow him. He tries to go up the mountain. They follow him. People are getting excited, and guess what? The people in power, the religious leaders, the civic leaders in the Roman Empire there at that time, they got upset. The story takes this dramatic left turn because they have Jesus arrested. They put him on trial. They beat him within an inch of his life. And then they murder him on a cross like a common criminal. The one who has been saying that everything is going to be made right and made good again. And all of a sudden he's gone. Can you imagine the people who had been following him? The people who knew those scriptures so well from Act 3. And they were like, this is the one the prophets were talking about. He's the one. He's the land that we've been talking about. But maybe they forgot those verses in Isaiah because it said it pretty clearly that he was going to be crushed. But I think they must have found themselves crushed, right? This one that they thought was going to overthrow the Roman Empire and become their king and lead them back into glory was dead. But the best news we could ever find out is that that ended up being part of the story. Part of the plan that God had all along. Because Jesus did not stay dead. He rose from the grave three days later. The climax of the story, the climax of this entire narrative, what we believe about the Bible is right here. He rose from the grave. Amen? 
He comes back to life. Don't miss this part, right? So act one, creation, good, beauty. Act two, sin. What is sin called? Death, separation from God. Sin and death. What did Jesus do when he rose from the grave? He defeated sin and death once and for all. So the thing that sent everything off course in Act 2, here in Act 4, Jesus has made it right. He has redeemed God's people, Israel, back to God, but then also says it's not just for them, it's for everybody. We all get to get in on it. You don't have to be an Israelite. You don't have to be a Jew. We're going to open this up for the whole world. He made things right again. And the Bible says that anyone who believes in him is saved from sin and death. Because of what he did, not just on the cross, but when he rose from that grave. John 1, 12, all who, yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. They are grafted in there with Israel as the people of God who share in that covenant once and for all. The story, y'all, was headed in a bad direction for us. But the storyteller steps into that storyline and does something miraculous does something that changes the course of human history forever. That's act four. That's Jesus. That's redemption. Now I'm going to skip act five. We're going to jump to act six. Act six is called restoration. Jesus left. He ascended to heaven, but he promised to return. And when he does, the entire world is going to be restored. Act six, restoration. The book of Revelation has some crazy visions in it, right? It has some crazy stuff in it. But I think the message is pretty clear. Jesus is going to return, and when he does, things are going to be restored. All things are going to be made new. That goodness from the garden is going to be back right here on earth as it is in heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the older, old, old order of things has passed away. See, that's the conclusion of the story in Acts 6. That's the conclusion that this overarching storyline that we find in the Bible is headed towards. Complete restoration and complete healing. No more pain. No more crying. No more death. It's all going to be what? Very good. Just like it was at the end of Genesis 1. Things are going back that way when Jesus returns. Now, I left a lot of stuff out. This was the Cliff's Notes Bible, let's be honest. But they're college students. They're going to be using the Cliff's Notes, okay? So, that was, thank you for laughing. That was funny. Um, I might use that tomorrow. <clears throat> That's the big picture story of the, of, of the Bible, right? Acts 1 through 6, creation, the fall, Israel, Jesus, I skipped one, restoration. That's, that's what it is. It started out good and it's going to end good. Do you believe that? If we believe that, remember the, the whole idea here was how does it shape the way we live? How do we find ourselves in this story? Well, just like Act 3, Israel, was that long section between the fall and Jesus. I believe that there's an Act 5 and that you and I are living in it right now. Act 5, let's call it the church. Because that's what Jesus' followers created after he left. After his death and resurrection. They actually called it the way but the way sounds a little bit like a creepy cult, you know? It sounds like one of those shows on Hulu. We don't want to call it the way anymore, so we kind of created. But what we're doing right now in this place, the church, this is what was created. It's an extension of what was created. People, Jesus' people gathering. Jesus' people studying the text, exhorting one another, uh, praying for one another, eating together, sharing meals, being together in community. That's what we created this thing called the church. And Martha, without knowing it, read to the kids a text this morning that was in my sermon. He told the church what he wanted them to do, didn't he? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He's talking to his disciples. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, 
I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, I've got the authority and I'm with you, so you need to go do this. What's the mission of the church? What is the mission of Act 5? The mission is to make more followers of Jesus. The mission is to tell this story. It's not just, by the way, it's not just to baptize people and make converts. Dallas Willard calls this one section of the Great Commission the the Great Omission. Because it also says we need to teach them to obey his commands. Baptists historically have done this very well, by the way. We have Sunday school. It's Sunday school because we want to teach you how to live the way Jesus taught us to live, right? We don't want to leave that part out. When we look at the Gospels, when we look at the teachings of Jesus, most of what he was doing was teaching people how to live their lives in response to what he was preaching, which was that the kingdom of God was coming. He was saying, hey, we're going to make all things new at the end. You need to live like it. And this is what living like it looks like. Does that make sense? He's teaching you how to live your life. We know that ending is very good. you got to live like you believe that is what Jesus was saying. So I think essentially what Jesus was teaching us in in this picture that I'm painting, Jesus was teaching us how to become part of the storyline, how to live into that, how to become his storytellers, how to tell this story in a good way with our lives. We are in Act 5 right now. The story is not over, but we know how it's going to end. And we need to live like it. Have you ever have you ever played Monopoly? Raise your hand if you played Monopoly. Great game. Takes forever though. You know the get out of, get out of jail free card. Love it. If you land on go to jail, go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. You go to jail. But if you have the get out of free jail free card, you drop that down and you don't have to lose your turn, right? I think sometimes, maybe often, in the world of Christianity, when we think about what it means to have faith, to believe in Jesus, that we sometimes oversimplify it and we boil it down to a get-out-of-hell-free card. That what it means to be a Christ follower, what it means to buy into this story is simply put, when I'm done and I get to the gates, I hand over my get-out-of-hell-free card and I get to go to heaven when I die, and that's all that matters. Let me be very clear with you. I believe that when we are done here, that we will be with Jesus if he is our Savior. But I also believe that when we see this grand narrative, this big picture that God is telling throughout the Bible, throughout history and creation, when we really understand what it means that Jesus' death was followed by his resurrection, that he defeated sin and death once and for all, I believe that we can't just think about where we go when we die. That The only right response is to say, I'm going to give my life to this right here and right now. I'm going to give my life to this. I am going to become part of this story with how I live my life on a day-to-day basis. Remember, my, my concept here is I'm saying, what do we, how does what we believe shape the way we, we live? So if we believe that God created something good, and if we believe that Jesus, the Savior King, is going to return and make all things good again, then we need to live like it every day. That's the only right response to the reality of what God has done for us through Christ, to the reality of this story that he is telling. We need to be the kind of people who carry that goodness and that hope and that joy with us everywhere we go. Because that's how this story started and that's how it's going to end and we're going to live like we believe that's true. So how do you do that? How do you sow truth and goodness and beauty and hope into the world around you. This is going to sound a little kooky. I like, to, I like to envision it this way, that everywhere I go, there is an invisible doorway standing next to me, just a threshold in a doorway. And on the other side of that doorway is God's future, the goodness and the reality and the truth of that all things are going to be made new. And as I'm walking along in my daily life, I get to decide with how I act and how I live if I'm going to open that door and let it rush into the world around me right here and right now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And and I have to just confess that most of the time I walk around with that door firmly shut because all I'm really cared about is myself. If I had to to tell you what my life really looks like, I would say most of the time I'm focused on Tim. And how can Tim's will be done on earth, right? How can I get what I want? How can I get around the person who's driving in the wrong lane? 
How can I get what I need at work or get what I need at home? All of these things. But, but what happens when we say, no, I'm going to open that door and let the goodness of God rush into my life? It's, it's, it's not rocket science either. You don't have to go be a foreign missionary, although we love what they're doing. It's as simple as being kind to the person who's checking out your groceries. It's as simple as noticing when your coworker seems a little bit down and asking them how they're doing. It's about being the one who asks for forgiveness for the person you know that you've wronged. It's about not starting that conversation at the Thanksgiving table about politics. It's about looking for ways to sow truth and beauty and goodness into the world because we know that's where this story is headed. A theologian named N.T. Wright says it this way, what you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself, what you, as yourself, what you do in the present will last into God's future. These activities are not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly, a little more bearable until the day when we can leave it all behind. They are part of what we may call building God's kingdom. We are invited, I believe, to, to participate in this story. What do I believe about the Bible, big picture? I believe that God has a plan. That it started good, that it's going to end good, that things got a little wonky, but that Jesus died and rose again so that it could be good again. And that we are invited to be part of that storyline. We are invited to participate in the work of God's kingdom by living our lives like we believe it every single day. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that at that moment of the story where it seemed like things could not figure themselves out, that you stepped in that you taught us the way, you showed us what it looked like, that you gave your life for our sins, but that you did not stay dead, that you defeated sin and death when you rose from the grave. Thank you, Jesus, that you are coming again. Lord, would you come soon to make all things new, to bring that truth and good, goodness and beauty back into our world. Would you show us what it means to live like we believe that, God? Amen. We're going to sing a song of response to give you some time to reflect. I know Pastor Will's going to come down here. If you'd like someone to pray with or talk with, he would be glad to do that with you. As we sing, I invite you to think about what it looks like for you to live your life like you believe that this is true. Would you stand as we do? This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in here in the love of Christ, I stand. Oh, 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 oh. oh, 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 oh. oh, 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 oh. oh, 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 oh. There in the ground, his body. Oh,
Thank you, Tim, for that message. As we leave here today, go and see where you fit in the narrative of what God is doing in this world and in our lives. Go in peace. <laughs>